Henri Corbin was born in Paris on the 14th of April, 1903, to Henri Arthur Corbin and Eugenie Fournier. His mother died six days later. He was raised by his aunt. His health was fragile in his early years, and he was frequently forced to interrupt his studies. He showed a strong affinity for music and studied organ and theory. These pictures of a young Henri at the age of five or six are truly <laughs> remarkable. Corbin attended the Monastery School of St. Mar, later the Seminary School of E.C., and he received a certificate in scholastic philosophy at the Catholic Institute of Paris in 1922. In 1925, he took his licence in, under the great Thomist Etienne Gilson at the École Pratique des Hautes Etudes in Paris with a thesis entitled Latin Avicennism in the Middle Ages. Corbin was entranced by Gilson's scholarship and his ability to bring medieval texts to life. Gilson was then beginning his own study of the role of Islamic philosophy in the development of scholastic thought in the West. Corbin admired him immensely and took the master interpreter as his model. He wrote, This was my first contact with Islamic philosophy. I discovered there a complicity between cosmology and angelology, and this angelological concern has not left me during my entire life. During the same period, he attended Emile Brehier's lectures on the relation between Plotinus and the Upanishads. He said, how could a young philosopher avid for metaphysical adventure resist this appeal? to study deeply the influences or traces of Indian philosophy in the work of the founder of Neoplatonism, what he referred to as a notorious period of mental asceticism, followed his decision to undertake the simultaneous study of Arabic and Sanskrit. He had, of course, already mastered both Greek and Latin, as well as a number of modern European languages. He tended the Oriental collection at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris beginning in 1928. There he encountered the influential Islamicist Louis Massignon, who was director of Islamic studies at the École des Auditudes. In lectures, the contrast with Gilson's methodical and rigorous style was striking. A class would begin, Corbin writes, with one of the flashing intuitions of which the great mystic Massignon was unsparing, and then a parenthesis would open, and then another, and then another. Finally, the listener found himself stunned and bewildered, arguing with the master about British politics in Palestine. Corbin's proclivity for the mystical element in Oriental studies was confirmed by contact with Massignon. He, he wrote... There was no escaping his influence, his soul of fire, his bold penetration into the arcana of mystical life in Islam, where no one had before penetrated in this way. The nobility of his indignations at the cowardice in the world, all of this inevitably made its imprint on the spirit of his young listeners. It was Massignon who first turned Corbin's attention to the writings of Shihab al-Din Yaha al-Shurvardi, Sheikh al-Ishraq, the 12th century Iranian theosopher of light, whose writings were to profoundly affect the course of Corbin's life. He wrote, Thus it was one day, I think in the year 2728, I spoke to him of the reasons that had led me as a philosopher to the study of Arabic questions that posed themselves to me concerning the connections between philosophy and mysticism, and that I knew through a scanty resume in German of a certain sure Vardy. Then Massignon had an inspiration from heaven. He had brought back from a trip to Iran a lithographed edition of the major work of Shurvardi, Hikmat al-Ishraq, the Oriental Theosophy, 
With commentaries, it formed a large volume of more than 500 pages. Take it, he said to me. I think there is in this book something for you. The something was the company of the young Sheikh Ali Shrock, who has not left me my whole life. I had always been a Platonist in the broad sense of the term. I believe that one is born a Platonist as one is born an atheist or materialist and so on. Oh, the unfathomable mystery of pre-existential choices. The young Platonist that I was then could only take fire at contact with the one who was the imam of the Platonists of Persia. Through my meeting with Shurovardi, my spiritual destiny for the passage through this world was sealed. Platonism, expressed in terms of the Zoroastrian angelology of ancient Persia, illuminated the path I was seeking. There were no longer any doubts about the directions the main lines of his research would take, and Korban began in earnest the study of Turkish, Persian, and Arabic. As if this weren't already enough for several lifetimes, Corbin's interests extended equally far in other directions. During the 20s and early 30s, he simultaneously pursued studies that in and of themselves would have clearly marked him as a brilliant and eclectic Protestant theologian. He became deeply engaged with the German theological tradition, what he would later call the lineage of hermeneutics, Burma, Luther, Hamann, Schleiermacher, Diltai, Heidegger, and Barth. In 1931, he was a co-founder, along with two Protestant pastors, of a short-lived periodical called Hick and Nunc, a journal for theological renewal, inspired by the early writings of Barth. He lectured and delivered papers on Luther, Kierkegaard, and Hamann, at the same time publishing translations of Shuravardi in 33, 35, and 39. He was also the first to translate the early works of Karl Barth into French. The writings of both, this is he's so extraordinary. I mean, really, it does boggle the mind. The writings of both Luther and Hamann profoundly affected Corbin's understanding of Islamic mysticism. The primary importance of Luther was to provide insight into the contrast between the revealed and the hidden God, and into the meaning of significatio passiva, the presence in us of those characteristics by means of which we know God. Haman provided the foundations of a mystical hermeneutics, that is, a mystical form of interpretation of the divine word, which was central to Corbin's philosophical development. But it was his reading of Heidegger's Being and Time in 1930 that was to be the defining moment in his struggle to grasp the meaning of hermeneutics as the science of interpretation. The two met for the first time in Freiburg in 1931. Corbin traveled there again in 36 to submit the first French translation of any of Heidegger's works, which was to appear in 39 as Qu'est-ce que la métaphysique? In 1932, at the age of 29, Corbin traveled to Sweden, where he visited the philologist Georges de Dumézil and H.S. Nieberg, the scho a scholar of both Iran and the Arabic world. While in Dalekarlia, on the shores of Lake Siljan, he wrote a moving meditation which he called Theology by the Lakeside. It's worth quoting at some length for the light it sheds on Corbin's mystical sensibilities. He wrote, Everything is but revelation. There can only be revelation. But revelation comes from the Spirit, and there is no knowledge of Spirit. It will soon be dusk, but for now the clouds are still clear, the pines are not yet darkened, the lake brightens them into transparency. And everything is green, with a green that would be richer than pulling all the organ stops in a recital. It must be heard seated, very close to the earth, arms crossed, eyes closed, pretending to sleep. 
for it is not necessary to strut about like a conqueror and to give a name to things, to everything. It is they who will tell you who they are if you listen, yielding like a lover. For suddenly for you, in the untroubled peace of this forest of the north, the earth has come to thou, visible as an angel that would perhaps be a woman. And in this apparition, this greatly green and thronging solitude, yes, the angel too is robed in green, the green of dusk, of silence, and of truth. And then there is in you all the sweetness that is present in the surrender to an embrace that triumphs over you. At each moment where you read in truth as now what is there before you, where you hear the angel and the earth and woman, then you receive everything, everything in your absolute poverty. But as soon as you have read and you have received, as soon as you consider, as you want to understand, as soon as you want to possess and give a name to explain and recover, there's only a cipher and your judgment is pronounced. You are the poor one, you are man, and he is God. And you cannot know God or the angel or the earth or woman. You must be encountered, taken, known, that they may speak. Otherwise, you're alone. In 1933, he married the woman who was to be his lifelong companion, Stella Leonhardt. In 1939, they traveled to Istanbul for what was intended as a six-month stay to collect manuscripts for a critical edition of Shurivardi. Corbin served as the only member of the French Institute of Archaeology there until the end of the war. When his replacement arrived in September of 1945, the Corbans left Istanbul for Tehran and arrived on the 14th of September in the country the color of heaven, he wrote. In November, Corbin was instr instrumental in launching a project to create a department of aeronology in the new Institut Francais. He and Stella returned finally to Paris in July of 1946. In 1949, he first attended the Aranos Conferences in Ascona, Switzerland, where he was a major figure until his death. In 1954, he was to succeed Massignon in the chair of Islam and the religions of Arabia. The three major works upon which his reputation rests in the English-speaking world were first published in French in the 1950s. They are Avicenna and the Visionary Recital, Creative Imagination in the Sufism of Ibn Arabi, and Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth. The work which is generally regarded as his magnum opus, which is as yet untranslated into English, is the four-volume on Islam Iranian, Aspect Spirituel et Philosophique, which appeared between 1971 and 1973. From the 1950s on, he spent the autumn in Tehran, winter in Paris, and spring in Ascona. In 1974, he and a group of colleagues, including Gilbert Durand and Antoine Fevre, founded the University of St. John of Jerusalem, the International Center for Comparative Spiritual Research. He never considered himself an Orientalist, or a philologist, or a scholar of scholasticism or modern Western philosophy. He was simply a philosopher pursuing a quest. At the age of 70, he wrote, To be a philosopher is to take the road, never settling down in some place of satisfaction with a theory of the world, not even a place of reformation, nor of some illusory transformation of the conditions of this world. 
It aims for self-transformation, for inner metamorphosis, which is implied by the notion of a spiritual rebirth. The adventure of the mystical philosopher is essentially seen as a voyage which progresses towards the life. Corbin's life was spent teaching, writing, lecturing, and editing critical, critical editions of Persian and Arabic manuscripts. His public work, published work includes over 200 critical editions, translations, books, and articles. He presented his last paper in June 1978, entitled Eyes of Flesh, Eyes of Fire, The Science of Gnosis. Here is an excerpt from Stella Corbin's memoir of his final days. She writes, On the 26th of September, the doctor authorizes the return to Rue Odillon. Henri, overjoyed, barely sleeps, plans to finish his works, and then, slightly troubled, asks the doctor, But do you think I can finish this book? Dr. Gonneau says, Oh, I know you, even if you had a hundred years ahead of you, you would ask me the same question. You would have yet another urgent book to finish, and many more besides. Corbin replied, That may well be. The thing is, you see, with my books, I'm struggling against the same thing as you. Each in our own way, you as doctor and I as historian of religions, are engaged in the same struggle. We're leading a campaign against death. He died on October 7th, 1978, at the age of 75 and was thus spared the anguish of witnessing the chaos into which Iran was shortly to be plunged. His body was interred in the old cemetery in Montmorency, a few miles north of Paris.